I'm going to tell somebody, I don't know it yet. You haven't told me, but I'm thankful for your testimony. Come on. You ain't said it yet, but I thank you. What are we doing? We're prophesying to each other this morning. Come on. How many of you want a testimony, huh? Come on. Tell somebody else. I know you haven't said it yet, but I'm thankful for your testimony. Yes, 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 yes. As I look back over my life. Amen. Daniel chapter number one. We're going to read three verses there. Uh, verses number eight, verse number nine. And verse number 15. I'm reading, I believe. Nope, this is a new American standard, but let's read it. Um, but Daniel made up his mind that he would not defile himself with the king's choice food or with the wine which he drank. So he sought permission from the commander of the officials that he might not defile himself. Now, God granted Daniel favor and compassion in the sight of the commander of the officials verse number 15 and i'm sorry at the end of 10 days their appearance seemed better and they were fatter than all the youths who had been eating the king's choice food at the end of the day tell somebody at the end of the day yeah, y'all used that with some stroking necks and snapping fingers before. I know you have at the end of the day. See, you thought even with an attitude, you was in the scripture, huh? Uh, <laughs> that's how I save you. Why? You didn't realize it when you was in your little funky place. You was talking about the word of God. At the end of the days, their appearance seemed better and they were fatter than all the youths who have been eating the king's choice food. For our thought today, chasing giants, I know who I am. I know who I am. You can be seated in the presence of God. Our teens and children are free to go for ministry. Amen. I know who I am. Amen. God is just faithful and he's good. Amen. And I was seeking the Lord. This is what I had on Wednesday night when the Holy Spirit came and took over Bible study. If you were here or if you were watching online, oh, what a night. Amen. And if you missed it, go back on YouTube and check it out and make sure you share it because it is amazing. Uh, today, I am going to talk about our identity. Somebody say identity. I was meditating on our series Chasing Giants, and I realized that sometimes a giant or some of the things that we deal with or navigate in life have sneaky ways of impacting how we see ourselves. And I believe that it is necessary for us as we continue to engage this teaching series that we understand who we are. And it's important to know that. It's important to have a solid foundation in our own personality and our own oneness and our own uniqueness. It's necessary for us then to be able to identify. Why? Because life happens. Have you ever been in the midst of a situation or a circumstance or a group of people where you couldn't be yourself? Anybody ever been around something or going through a transition or something in life and you knew that it was causing you to not be authentically who you know yourself to be? Anybody ever been out of sorts over a matter or over a person, over a situation? How many of us have people that will pull us out of character? Come on, you've said that before. You got me acting out of character. I don't act this way. I don't talk this way. Why? Because there are external influences or external stimuli that bring a different part of us out or cause a different part of our character to respond. And if we're not solid in our identity, if we're not solid in our character, giants will have a way of triggering something in us so that he can affect our witness. And so I believe that the Lord wants us to know today that it's important that we keep tabs on who we are. Have you ever told someone or has it ever been said to you that you've lost track of who you are? 
you're not acting yourself. You're acting unseemly. Isn't that what David's wife said to him when he danced out of his priestly garments? And, you know, what, what, what is going on with the king? This is not how kings carry themselves. And, then, and he said, listen here, I will become, I believe in another part, even more undignified than this. In other words, the identity that the part of my character, David would say, that I am portraying the part of my character that I am living out in this moment is the part of me who is a grateful praiser. That there is a part of me who understands the impact and the potency or the power of my praise and my worship. And so if my praise makes me seem uh, or act unseemingly, the better question for you is why are you praising God to the point that you are out of sorts? Well, I'm praising God to the point that I am out of sorts because I was out of sorts and in order to get me back in sorts God had to work a miracle bring deliverance move some stuff give me some healing help me to understand and so because I know where I was before God stepped in and intervened I'm gonna praise him like it's my last time or opportunity to praise my God does that make sense for anybody and so when people ask why are you acting like this you think this is something you, you, you think this is unseemly? Okay. Let me think. Give me two seconds to think about the last biggest thing God did in my life. Let me go back real, real quick to the moment in my life, not 10 years ago, not five years ago. How about just on Tuesday when I think about what God did for me and how I was in a low place and it was his word that kept me and picked me up and mounted me up that by the time I got to church on Wednesday, the Lord spoke a prophetic word through me. Let me act more undignified than this because you have no idea. So why do we let people dictate our response to God? Why? Why do we do that? So let's talk about identity. I know who I am. Identity is important for us to understand in this series or in this season because let's go back to the definition of giants. Lady British, who taught so, so amazingly last week, hit on so many points and she reminded us of this long definition of what is a giant. Amen. Uh, Naya captured it and she shrunk it for me. But I'm going to keep with this one because it's it's meaty and I want us to get some things from it. A giant is anyone or anything that is adversarial to your purpose, position, posture, assignment, or destiny. A giant's goal is to destroy, derail, disrupt, dilute, or delete, watch this, our character, our witness, our assignment, our destiny, or our reputation before God, Jesus, the Holy Spirit, and others. In other words, giants want to distort your identity so that you forget who you are in the first place. Here's what I've learned about describing ourselves. When you're in those circles, in those groups, right? When you're around other people, y'all warm or cold? Which one? Just fine, hot, burning up. Can we get one notch? Because I'm hot too. Glory to Jesus. I, I won't say what I'm thinking, but if you look around at who's fanning, it might give you a clue. Glory to Jesus. So, you ever been... <laughs> a lot of them so uh <laughs> she said really i'm sorry i'm so sorry <laughs> so it's hot i'm hot so so here we go come on see i'll pray for the pastor that's why y'all got to pray i gotta get through this Amen. So we have to understand how many of you have been in in settings where you have to go around a circle and they ask you who are you I'm sorry, how many of you find difficulty in answering that question? Who are you? The average one of us, when asked who we are, we many times begin to describe or identify ourselves by what we do more than who we really are at our core. Anybody ever experienced that? We define ourselves by what we do. Why? Because the perception is that what you do is indicative of who you are. Now, I agree with that to a great extent because out of your heart, your mouth speaks. Out of your heart, you act. But when someone asks us the question, why do we have to scratch our heads to answer the question directly? I didn't ask you what you do. 
Hi, Anthony Thomas is your name. Yes, that's my name. Who are you? Well, I'm a pastor. I'm a school counselor. I'm an entrepreneur. This all describes what I do. It leaves the listener to fish in their brains. Well, okay, he's a pastor, so that means he's what? Well, not all pastors are created equal, so I'm still not telling you who I am. Well, he's a school counselor. Okay, that means he's went to school because he went to college. That No, not all college graduates are created equal, so I'm still not giving you my identity. I'm telling you what I do. And it always seems more challenging to answer that question. And so when I know who I am, I know who I am not. When I know who I am, I know who I am not. In other words, because I know who I am or when I know who I am, you cannot, no one else can ascribe to me my identity. The, the weakness or the problem with not knowing who we are is that when we are in, in areas of our lives lack confidence of who we are or we don't really know or haven't invested time and energy and effort spiritually to find out who we are in a certain area, we'll gravitate to the person or the thing that identifies most with where we want to be. And we, excuse me, we grab hold of the things of where we want to be and then we start to assimilate. That's why when your children get out the house, they act a fool sometimes. Because they don't fully know who they are in a certain area of their lives. And for children, it's the parents' responsibility. It's our responsibility to help them identify who they are in those areas. It's difficult. You can't get it all into them in 18 years. Because they're going to go out and they're going to develop even further in their identity, right? And so we have to hold those things to be true, near, and dear to our hearts. And so I don't give in to what others are saying or thinking about me when I know who I am. Even if it's someone speaking into an area of my life that I don't have full confidence of who I am in that season or in that moment, uh, let me not just take what you say. You ever had somebody speak over your life? Oh, I see you doing this. I, I, I could imagine you do this. Oh, okay, well, I never thought about that. I'm not agreeing or disagreeing, but let me sit with that. Let me see where that fits in the grand scheme of things. Let me pray about that and see what is God saying about that. Does God bear witness to you that I'm that or I could be that? We have to be really intentional about our identity and who we are. We're going to go further. Now, let's define identity a little bit. Let's, let's deal with this word. No, I'm going to go up. If you go and look at Numbers chapter 13 and verse 33, we've been talking about this, and I told you that I'm intentionally repetitive in this first part of this series. This is when the 12 spies come back, Numbers 13 and 33. And I've talked about this already. It says, there also uh, we saw the Nephilim, uh, and we became like grasshoppers in our own sight, and so we were in their sight. Over there, we saw the Nephilim, big people, and we became like grasshoppers in our own sight, and so we were in their sight. You have to be careful not to allow external people and things change who you are. We have to know and we have to seek God. Psalm 139, the psalmist says, I am fearfully and wonderfully made my soul. Now, when you know something in your soul, you know it. He says, my soul knows it right well. So here they say, the 10 said, we saw the Nephilim. Watch this. And we became. What does the word became indicate? Come on, I know it's Sunday morning, but let's go to school. What the, talk back to me. What does the word became indicate in your mind? Change. In other words, you went, Moses said, go and just see, assess, survey, and come back and tell us what you saw. Moses never said go into Canaan and change your identity. He never said assess and choose who you will become based on the situation you see. Oh, that's good. Where's Dr. Dixon? Ree! 
much, huh? I'm, I'm, help, I'm helping myself. If y'all don't eat it, I will. You cannot allow what you're in make you change in order to assimilate to that situation. They're big. Their stature is larger than ours, uh, but don't become less than who you are because they're bigger than you. How many of you got some challenges in your life that are bigger than you? Are you going to become less than where you already are? Think about it. They were already in a place of comfort and, and authority. And he only said, go over and assess the land and come back and tell us what you see. So they went over with the capacity. It was all, watch this, winning was in their DNA. Canaan was their covenant promised land. And so before any in that generation was even born, God, you got to get this. God took Abram into the land. Their forefather walked in the land. He said, your children not can live here. Will. And so they went from a place of ownership. Wealth. Land flowing, milk and honey, big grapes. You saw all the report, and they became poor. Woo! Because the situation intimidated them. Caleb and Joshua, the Bible says, they had a different spirit. They were sure in their identity. Caleb remembered the promise. That's why when they got over there, Caleb, the Bible says, I believe he was 85 and he remembered that he had land and that his children would always have. He said, I don't care what they look like. The situation does not dictate who I am. So those 10 folks changed. They changed in the face of their giants. They changed in the face of adversity and they didn't change up. They changed down. Stop assimilating to situations and circumstances that are counter to who you really are. Might not have no money today or might not have this much money today, but I am not broke. I am not poor. I might not have enough. Well, I ain't never saying I might not have enough because God promised to provide what? all of my needs I may not have what I want the way I want it or when I want it it does not mean that I'm broke it does not mean I'm homeless it does not mean I'm poor it doesn't mean any of that it means simply I don't have what I want when I want it I'm not changing my identity because my bank account dictates dictates that I can't get the truck I want today when it's my season to drive that navy blue Y'all already know when it's my season, I'll have it. But I'm not changing who I am. You follow with me. And so that's what they did. They became like grasshoppers in their own sight. In other words, the way we see ourselves dictates the way we act. You got to understand that. We're trying to figure out why, why folk act like they're crazy. They're not crazy. They just don't have a proper vision of who they are. You're not crazy. I'm not crazy. Come on, we got to check this stuff for ourselves. I talk to myself in the mirror. Michael Jackson did it and made millions of dollars. At least he wrote a song about it. I don't know if he ever did it or not, but he said he did in the lyrics. And I tell myself, listen, this isn't you. Pick yourself up. You're fifthly. I'm telling you, in, in, in the theory and uh, uh, therapy world, it's positive self talk. Help me, Kelly. Am I right? I'm not cuckoo, am I? That's textbooks for that. <laughs> uh, and you have to help yourself. You got to do that because if we don't, circumstances and situations. How many of you were down in some area and you have to tell yourself, self, yourself, say, why you keep messing with me? You say, self, we got to get up. 
We got to wash our face. We got to put this oil of anointing on our head and we're going to go out here and we're going to go in the power and the strength of the Lord. So they became like grasshoppers in their own sight. So they changed. They diminished their identity. They became something else and they projected who they became onto the giants. Those giants never said y'all look like grasshoppers. Not according to this text. When you change the identity of who you are, you change how you respond to your enemy. The Giants won over those 10. They never had to do anything. The Giants won just by pure nature of them seeing the Giants, they bowed out of the fight. How many of us have walked away from fights based on what the situation looked like? And we come up with all these cockamamie excuses as to why we won't engage a fight. Well, I don't feel it in my spirit. I don't, the Lord hasn't told me to do that. The Lord has. Well, listen, man, they're about to crack you upside your head. What you need the Lord to say to you? <laughs> they're about to take your money and your job. What do you need? What word do you need from the Lord? Now, I know David, when they came back from Ziklag, the, there was fire. They took their wives and said, Lord, should I pursue? Yeah, you pursue and you'll recover all. I understand that. But sometimes, like, what do you need to do? Defend it. Let's go to 1 Samuel 17b. I'm sorry, 1726b. So they didn't know who they were. 1 Samuel 1726. I'll read the whole thing. David spoke to the men who were standing by saying, what will be done for the man who kills this Philistine and takes away the reproach of e from Israel? For who is this uncircumcised Philistine that he should taunt the armies of the living God? Now, because David knew to whose army he belonged, it triggered a part of his identity. David said the armies of the living God so in other words, he knew who they were fighting for. Now, maybe the army thought they were fighting for Saul, who was the king at that time, and he was over the army. But David's identity was triggered by the fear and the intimidation that Israel had of this Philistine and the Philistines, of this giant. He said, why? He said, this is not who we are. This man isn't coming against us. He's coming against the, God, the army of the living God. And so if I represent the army of the living God, what, what does his being a giant over me have to say? Why are you letting him taunt y'all for 40 days? This isn't Saul, Saul in the back scared too. This who y'all fight for? Yeah, fight for Saul and be chickens. I get it. You in the flesh. But it's not Saul's army. It's God's army. And I am offended because my identity, if I'm talking like David, my identity comes from God. I am fearfully and wonderfully made. Before the world, you pulled all of me together and you created me with respect and love and reverence. And you would create me to live for you, love you, worship you, praise you, fight for you. And I'm going to change all of that to become a wimp. So David says, who is this uncircumcised Philistine who would dare to taunt the armies of the living God? What does Brother Eliab say to him? What you doing here, man? Go back with them few little sheets. We taught this already. Go back and watch it. We, we, what, why would David was like, man, listen, I don't even have time for you. Saul, he didn't fully understand David's identity. Well, you too young to fight. You don't have any uh, uh, warrior clothes or whatever. Well, listen, let me tell you what I have done. So now because David was comfortable in his identity and Saul never asked David, who are you? He asked other people who were David and they told him who his father was and what he did and all of that. But because David was confident in his identity, when Saul said, you can't fight this giant. David's ability rose up in him. Maybe you know who I am, but where I come from. 
But let me help you know who I really am by what I've done. There was a lion one day. Here I still stand. There was a bear one day. Here I still stand. He says, well, you go in the power of the Lord. You got that right. Because you're not going to get up off your do nothing because you're scared. You're scared. So how many of us need that confidence to know that I am fighting for God and anything that comes against God is coming against me? And anything that comes against me is indirectly coming against God. And so if you don't get that, if you don't understand that, then you don't, you, we miss it. And we hold God to the identity of who he made us to be. Who are you? Tell somebody, I know who I am. I know who I am. Nehemiah chapter number four and verse five. I've preached this already. I'm being repetitive intentionally. It says, do not forgive their iniquity and let not their sin be blotted out before you, for they have demoralized the builders. This is the uh, New American Standard Bible. They have demoralized the builders. So we built the wall and the whole wall was joined together to the half of its height for the people had a mind to work. Now, this is Nehemiah, Sam Ballard. Remember, we said that every time Sam Ballard came back, he had more people because they were trying to intimidate Nehemiah. And so this is part of this is how he ended his prayer to God for them. He says, don't forgive their iniquities. He said, don't forgive them. And let their sin be blotted out uh, from before you because they have demoralized the builders. The ESV says they are coming against you. God, they made you angry. And so in other words, Nehemiah was not bothered to the extent that he was distracted for too long. Oh, Sam Ballard, what do you want now, bro? What? Why do you keep picking on us? What do you want? Anybody got some situations in your life or some people you need to be like, hey, man, hey, girl, what do you want? Why? Why do you keep coming back? Why do you keep calling me? Why do you keep ringing my bell? Why do you keep emailing me? Stop texting me already. I'm not coming down. You have to become irritated by your enemies because your identity does not dictate that they can tell you what to do. Nehemiah says, listen, bro, I'm tired of your foolishness. We're not coming down. I don't care how many other armies you bring. This is our conviction, and we're moving by conviction. I have purpose. I have destiny. I have an assignment on my life, and I know that you're simply a giant, and you're trying to derail me from the assignment of God in my life. I'm on the wall talking. While you talking trash, I'm halfway done with my assignment. So, no, I'm not coming down. Don't care how many armies you get. Don't care how many jokes you have. I don't care what you say about our wall and the fox that come. I don't care about none of that. As a matter of fact, I'm done talking to you. I know how to deal with you. Some of y'all need to stop talking back to people. Some of y'all need to stop giving uh, situations and circumstances, illnesses with a response. Sometimes you need to state, I just shared this with one of my children. You need to state, use I statements, I feel, A, B, C, D, when you, one, two, three, and sit it there and leave. You know why? Because everybody doesn't, number one, owe us a response. And number two, you don't even have to care sometimes about the response. It's not the response I'm after. It's the declaration that I need you to get in your heart. That's what I need you to get today. When I walk away from this, I need you to have the declaration in your heart that I ain't studying you. So respond or not, write it. Email me. I'm out. Drop the mic. Boop. This is who I am. So in me giving you that, I'm telling you, I don't have time for that. I'm not entertaining that. And so because Nehemiah knew what he was doing, he was, in, he was not impacted by their taunts because he knew to turn to pray to God. And then when he prayed to God, you got to understand, when you're really a child of God, yeah. some stuff you don't even need to waste your time on. Nehemiah, he, he said in chapter 4, he says, Hear, O God, how are we despised? Return their reproach on their own heads, 
Give them up for plunder for in the land of captivity. And don't forget, how are you going to pray and ask God not to forgive somebody's sins? <laughs> in other words, send them to hell. Woo! The pastor told me to pray that my uh, best friend. No, I didn't tell you that. Go telling your boss. Oh, I had a good time at church today. My pastor told me to tell you he is a goat. No, I did not tell you that. You tell your truth. I ain't telling you to say that now. You. <laughs> So we got to understand he turned and prayed and the Bible says, look at verse six. So we built the wall. We built the wall. So guess what? I'm done. Because I know who I am. Because I know who I am. I hold. I know who I am not. I am not a quitter. I don't walk away. I don't run from adversity. Come on. I know who I am not. So when you get done, while you down there taunting and complaining, go get eight more armies. We're going to build and pray. By the, by the way, I got concealed and carry, so you better watch your back while I'm working. They didn't have it then. They had their swords. I'm just giving you the Bible in updated language. The Bible said they tell them to get their tools and their weapons. Read your Bible. They say, get your tools and your weapons. So, you know, like you got a foy card and you got all that stuff. You got, I know y'all doing y'all thing, right? And so sometimes you got to tell the enemy, I'm packing, but I'm working. I'm packing, but I'm ignoring you. I'm packing because I'm praying that God will handle you. I'm packing, but the Holy Spirit is going to do the shooting. Woo, I ain't never got to pull the trigger. You going down. You going down. Focus, Pastor, focus. All right, let's get us out of here. All right, so going back to clarifying identity, and I'm going to close with this. So how do we define our identity? How do we get to be like a David and a Nehemiah and a Daniel? How do we get to be that way? In my text, the text that I chose, Daniel and his friends, they actually have gotten into uh, their under Nebuchadnezzar's reign in Babylon. And that's where God put them because they lost the track of who they were, Israel. And they had to go there. And the Bible says that, that it came where uh, in Daniel chapter number one, that the king ordered them uh, to bring some of the people of Israel, the royal family, the nobles, the youth, Daniel and his friends were young people. Uh, the king said to them, this is what y'all are going to eat daily uh, from the king's choice food and his wine is what he appointed. Uh, um, it says that they should be educated three years at the end of which they were to enter into the king's personal service. And so Daniel is in the school of Nebuchadnezzar, not by choice, but by force. His whole identity of who he came from, his culture, his people, his ethnicity, his context, his whole identity was just challenged because of the behavior of his forefathers. The Bible says he was a youth. <laughs> and so they said, eat this because we got to train them so that they can enter into the king's personal service. And it says, now among them he took from Judah, Daniel, Hananiah, Mishael, and Azariah. That's your Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. They changed their names. They changed their names. Regardless of what people call you, don't let names dictate your identity. Don't let the title and the names that people ascribe to you dictate who you are. You are who you are. A name doesn't make you. A title doesn't make you. That's why some folks get titles and they act unseemingly. Because they don't know how to deal with a title. You got letters behind your name. I got letters in my name. What's the problem? We all have letters. You don't have a name without letters. Like, uh. But I earn these. Like, good for you. You've got stick to it in this, buddy. Good job. <laughs> huh? And, and I get it. Titles are important. We have them. I have, you know what I'm saying? But don't let a title define who you are. Some people, they walk across the stage or they get something, they get a new title, they get a promotion. And, oh, boy. I, I, I'm bishop and you refer to me as bishop. 
Well, I felt homie was more intimate and connected because that's what we were before you became bishop. But, well, bishop, have a good one. Huh? You got, you know, you can't, you can't let that do those things to you. I'm sorry. So don't let what people call you change your identity. All right. And so the Bible says that they he pulled them out and the commander of the officials assigned new names to them. To Daniel, he assigned the name Belteshar, Belteshazzar, sorry, to Hananiah, Shadrach, to Mishael, Meshach, and to Azariah, Abednego. Watch this. Somebody say, but. but. That's what you got to tell your enemies. That's what you got to tell sickness. That's what you got to tell oppression. That's what you got to tell discomfort. That's what you got to tell infirmity. But. I know what the doctor said. But. I know what my finances dictate. But. I even know the consequences of the choices I made. But. Come on, let's be honest. Because every giant is not an external thing. Some of the stuff we're fighting for is because we did some stuff. But grace is sufficient. This thorn in my flesh, the guilt, the shame. Come on now, let's be real. The, the, the guilt and the shame that accompanies the decisions that we have made can try to taunt us and change our identity. Because we'll try to assimilate to what guilt says we are. Oh, my God. We'll try to assimilate to what shame says we are. So Daniel said, but. <laughs> I'm going to put some hearts on that for myself because that just blessed me. Daniel made up his mind that he would not defile himself with the king's choice food or with the wine that he drank. So he sought permission from the commander of the officials that he may watch this. Look at the language. He sought command, uh, permission from the commander of the officials that he might not defile himself. In other words, unlike those 10 spies, he said, hey, Mr. Boss Man, can I eat a different meal? Because this junk is about to change who I am. Don't swallow. Don't even taste it. Don't even chew what somebody has to say about you or what somebody offers you if it doesn't match who you are. He said, if I eat this, it's going to change who I am. I don't want your stuff to defile me. You know that I'm an alien to Babylon. You know why I'm here, and I know why I'm here. Let's cut the mess. I don't want your food because it's not my custom. It's not who I am. And so he says, man, look, if the king find out, he's going to kill me, blah, 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 blah. God granted Daniel favor. When God gives you favor, when favor is a part of who we are, favor is in our DNA. It's, 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 it's bound up in our hearts. It is what God puts on us to make people who would choose to otherwise identify us change their minds. That's what favor will do. And so they have favor and it comes out that they ate and they were good looking. And by the time you get to verse 15, it says at the end of the 10 days. Their appearance seemed better and they were fatter than all the youths uh, at, that had been eating the king choice food. And so they said, where is it? Where is it? The overseer continued to withhold their choice food and wine and kept giving them vegetables. God gave them acknowledge, intelligence and they just began to read and they became smart because they did not allow their identity to become that of the Babylonians. You do not have to change who you are in the face of adversity and in your giant. So I'm going to give you these points and we're done for real. When I know my worth, when I know my value, when I know my calling, when I know my purpose, all those things in the definition of a giant, certain things don't phase me. Don't phase me. I, I know where I am. I'm good with where I am. I understand where I'm going. When my confidence built as a, as a fat man, fat guy, kid, all the stuff I went through, I got to a point in life, Ruth, like, Anthony, you're fat. And I was like, yep, you are. So the next person that came, man, with your fat, you saw this, I was like, I'm fat. You're not a prophet. <laughs> I'm fat. Like, <laughs> you know what it did? You know what it did? It took their power. 
It took their power. Because you're not telling me anything that I don't know. What? Okay, yeah. <laughs> you're smart. What's your IQ? How long did it take you to figure that out? I'm fat. Like, you slow. <laughs> Right. So you got to be able to disarm your enemies. How do you do that? With the truth of our identity. You ain't never gone. You're going to be this. Sorry, not sorry, but let me help you understand. Because apparently you don't know who I am. So since you don't know how to ask. Let me tell you. Or as we teach our children, I don't agree with that assessment. (laughs) Of me that you're making. So I'm going to go this way. Because I don't even feel like it's worth you really knowing who I am. You have a great day. Ooh, those are fighting words to a giant. Like, I'm not getting ready to even waste my energy. All right? When you know who you are, you know who you're not. So defining identity. The basic definition of identity is the fact of being who or what a person is. That's it. Right. On the surface, who or what a person is. Identity includes our character traits. That's when you start getting into that kind of stuff. Huh? Short tempered, attitude and no, you know, this, that and the third and blah, blah, blah. And fun and courageous and outgoing and uh, forgiving and merciful and unforgiving and all those kind of things are character traits. But watch this. Various constructs and context are. Uh, impact or impede our identity you could be a certain way but a context how many of you know if you stay in a certain context or environment too long it can impact your character anybody you went home your mother say that ain't how I raised you that's not who you are that's not what we putting you in this house because you've been in a certain context. When I was a child and I would go to my sister, we remember this, and I would go to New Orleans uh, with our dad's family, just spend the summer or whatever. My mother wouldn't want to talk to me because I would come back talking like them down south. <laughs> Boy, if you don't get up out of here, I can't have on this. I don't understand what you're saying. Come up here talking like them folks down there because it it's a context. My accent didn't change who I am. But you got to be careful. So these are things. And then you got to understand that different areas of our lives or that there are different types of identity that we have to be aware of. How many of you know we have a cultural identity? There's an ethnic identity. There's a national identity. That's why Nebuchadnezzar tried to infuse that into those guys because he wanted them to assimilate to their identity. He was training them. He put them because they were young in school to learn how to be the king's servants. And so he was saying, this is our identity and you need to conform to it if you're going to work here. That's why Daniel said, but uh, um, I'm not going to defile myself. Then we have a cultural identity. How many of you know that there's a professional identity? There's a religious identity. You see certain people out walking down the street on a Saturday morning, and you didn't already say who they are. <laughs> you see them with gray khakis and a white shirt on a bike. You already got an idea in your mind who they are. It's the same for us, traditionally at least. Huh? You see a woman with a two-piece suit and a hat, some high heels with sheer stockings and a hanky hanging out of her sleeve. You already know who she is. Oh, mother, if you give her a backhand, I won't call DCFS. (laughs) So listen, these are things that attribute to our identity. Pastor, why are you talking like this today? I'm talking like this because I believe That God needs for us to have a clear understanding of who we are. Because what he's getting ready to open us up into and where he's getting ready to take us, we need to be confident in who we are. Because our enemy would want nothing more than to put us to shame. And if he can put us to shame, it's more likely that he'll get us to run back. And so when you know who you are, You forge forward. When adversity comes, it's adversity. It's not an impact on who I am. 
I'm not going to become something I'm not because you're standing here. What I am is smart enough to figure out either how to get around or how to take you down. But I'm not going back. And when you know that God has called you to what he's called you to as an individual and then in his faith community. And I said this on Wednesday that God is bringing us into a space of deliverance and revival. And we need to be delivered personally from some things so that we can navigate forward and be who and what God is called and challenging us to be. Those are all important things. And so I believe that the Lord wants us to know that because there are going to be some giants that we're getting ready to come up against that if we are not careful, they'll cause us to become something that we're not. They'll cause us to become something that we are not and so it is necessary for us in this season to become more confident more bold more courageous about who we are and so I'm going to challenge us today that if there's areas of our identity that we're struggling in can we be honest doesn't matter how old one becomes there's What can we pray? How can we pray into this? Lord, what aspects of my identity are necessary for my assignment in this season? Because, you know, he doesn't deal with us all at one time. Could you really handle if the Holy Spirit had to (laughs) shift you and teach you this and make you deal with all these kind of things? Can you imagine if he did it at one time or in one week? Could you handle it? God is not slow. He will not put more on us than we are able to handle. We use that to encourage ourselves, don't we, when we're overwhelmed and we don't want to do things. But there are times in our lives where God challenges us up. And we can't always deal with it. While you're chasing giants, is anybody willing besides me to admit God's breaking you down in some areas? Look at this. (laughs) He's breaking me down in some stuff. But you know why he's doing it? Why is he doing it now? Because I couldn't have handled the improved version of myself and whatever he's breaking me. I couldn't have handled it then. And so this this season for us is so, and I'm going to say this first leg of this teaching because I know it's going to shift. But I just feel, I feel very strongly in my spirit that God is preparing us first. And that's what this 21 days in September is going to be about. And when we launch the small groups around it, I'm thinking the small groups might last longer than the 21 days. But it's for us to get together and work through some stuff. Can I be transparent? And we're going to have Calvary Cares get ready. Uh, for their presentations. We'll do our offering and all that first. We'll close with that. I, when my mom passed in February, I paused. You all know this already. I was very frustrated and overwhelmed picking up stuff and trying to get my life back in order, right? And in my brain, I said, well, the school year ends May 26th semester ends the week before that in terms of seminary I'm going to have the summer and I'm going to do less work and blah 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 so school ended the semester ended and I believe I was in a car with my wife and I was thinking I've already told you all this I was thinking about my birthday service coming up and I began to think about how my mom the year before had remarks and said too much <laughs> uh, that's an inside joke Um, and I broke down in the car because I realized in that moment that this would be my first birthday without my mother since the day I was born and that's been very hard for me over the past month at this point and then I thought like man God did when I got rid of all of those things and the weight of all those things did grief start Or did grief just have room because of all the other things that I was dealing with and and the frustration? I was frustrated and overwhelmed. I didn't say I was grieving because I didn't feel like I was. I was just trying to get through stuff. 
And until now, as I'm, as I'm putting things back together, my perspective on some things has changed. That's why I changed my major. Not just so much that life is short, like focus on the things that really matter. And so as God has been developing me and readjusting me in this season, that's one part of it. And then there are these other things that's like, yeah, and you got to do this and you got to fix this and you got to change. I'm like, oh, God, I can't take it all at one time. He's not. I'm not giving you all of it. I'm giving you for now what I need you to work through. And so God is asking us in this season, do you trust me enough to break you? Do you trust me enough to challenge you in some areas so that I can build a better version of you in those areas? Not that I don't. God's not saying he doesn't like us and that he made us. And we're following hard after him. But he knows our futures. He knows our destiny. He knows where he's ultimately taking us. And so how many of us can just stand before the Lord in our prayer time, corporately, individually, and say, Lord, just do what you do. I don't understand this. This is painful. It's aggravating. It's fun. It's funny. Whatever your response is to it. But how many of us trust God enough <laughs> to say, do it? Because our faith should say, if it's God, I'm going to come out better, more beautiful, and not physically, come to our text, but spiritually fatter. I ain't going to be fat again in Jesus' name. <laughs> but spiritually speaking, we're going to come out spiritually fatter, wiser, more intelligent, and all of those things. Amen? Amen. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for your word today. And we give you praise. Father, we thank you for the challenge that you're giving us in this series, in this first leg. We thank you, Father, that you are all-knowing and that we can trust you. And as such, Father, we pray today in the name of Jesus that as your word has hit us in various ways, that you will let it fall in good ground and that our hearts and our lives will forever be changed in the mighty name of Jesus. And Father, now I pray for that man, that woman that's not walking with you, pray God for that child that youth that is not saved today and I pray for them as I offer them salvation today those of you who are watching those of you who are in this room if you're not following Jesus if your identity if you don't have a spiritual identity that says you are a son of God then you're not saved I understand we're saved and we have areas of identity to work out. But if we don't even have the identity of sonship or daughters, we need that. And that's you today. And you're in this room. Raise your hand. If that's you and you're online, just type hashtag follow Jesus. Because we want you to be one with Christ. Amen. If you say, hey, I don't have a faith community identity. I don't have a church home. I don't have a place to call home. And you feel led to Calvary Covenant Church. If that's you, raise your hand or put join CCC on Facebook. I don't have YouTube, but media team. So if anyone's putting that there, let me know. Amen. If that's you, amen, let us know. Amen. So, Father, we just thank you for this time in your word. And we give you praise in Jesus' name. Amen. Come on, clap your hands and give God praise for the word of God.